turn in the Bible tonight to Matthew chapter 15 as we begin. Matthew chapter 15. I was reading this the other day and or just impressed some things upon my heart. I, if you have that uh, passage with me, look at what the Lord says to, he calls them hypocrites. He's talking to the Jewish leaders. In verse 8 of Matthew 15, he says, Ye, uh, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Verse 18, Those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile the man. I want to speak to you tonight on what I have titled the danger of pleasing God. I think that most of us as human beings are naturally performance driven people pleasers. And I think while it's true that believers must be concerned about pleasing God rather than being men pleasers, I think that often performance-driven believers turn their attention to pleasing God by simply ratcheting up their efforts through obedience to God, like they pray more, uh, they may read their Bibles more, or serve the Lord more, or witness more. People-pleasing, performance-driven Self-reliant people just love to-do lists, whether they be uh, uh, given by men or they dig them out of the Bible themselves. They love to-do lists. But what does it really mean to please God? That's what I want to consider with you tonight. And I want to, first of all, begin with a word of prayer and then uh, share some thoughts with you about who really pleases God. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can be together tonight, and thank you for your word. Thank you for these uh, thoughts that you give us from your word. Lord, we don't want to be like the hypocrites that you were describing in Matthew 15, <clears throat> who simply draw near to you uh, with their mouth, but their heart is far from you. People that uh, in vain worship you, simply teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. Lord, we pray that we would be a people that truly please you. Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit of God would grab our attention and hold it and and give us understanding tonight and help us to lift up Jesus, that he might be the one that receives the glory. We worship you, Lord, and we thank you again for you and your word as we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If I were to ask you, who is the person that pleases God, I'd probably get some different answers. But I want, th this, is, this is really a matter of identity. Who pleases God? Well, let me tell you this. There is only one person in the entire universe that always pleases God. And this person has pleased God from all eternity and uh, without end and has done so in everything. And it's so very clear when three times in the New Testament in the Gospels, you hear the voice of the Father speaking from heaven about Jesus. And he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And what he means by that is there has never been a single ripple of displeasure in all eternity that I have had concerning my son. Literally, when he says, I'm well pleased, he says, 
I am eternally delighted in him. Jesus is the one and the only person that always pleases God. He's the one who pleases God. And this is why our identity with Christ is so important. Remember on Sunday mornings, we've been talking about the difference between being in Christ and having Christ in us. I mean, when you think about it, if we're in Christ and Christ is in us, then our total identity is him. That he is the one that defines who we are. And so if Christ is the only one that pleases God, then if we have acceptance in Christ, then we please God. Think of it this way. Your being pleasing to God begins when you initially accept Jesus as your Savior. And I just assume that everyone sitting here tonight has done that. By your own testimony, you've testified to that. And so this is that initial acceptance of Jesus gives you your true identity, and he's the one that pleases God. So as a result, God's pleased with you in that sense. When you depend upon Jesus' work for you instead of your own, you become then accepted in him. In fact, listen how Paul says in Ephesians 1, 6, he says about Jesus, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein, that is, on the basis of his grace, he hath made us, God has made us accepted in the beloved, literally in the beloved one. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So because Jesus is accepted, when we get saved, we are accepted before the Father. Because Jesus pleases the Father, when we accept Jesus, we then are pleasing to the Father. Initial acceptance, but let me also quickly add a continuing acceptance. Because even after salvation, Pleasing God is never about what you as a believer can do for God. You must continue to depend upon and rest in the only one who can please him, and that's Jesus. Paul says in Romans 5 and verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom... We also have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. And so the only one that pleases God is Jesus. And uh, initially when we accept him, we then step into that beloved one and we please God, but we must continue by depending upon him because the truth of the matter is, folks, on your best day, with your best works, you and I are no more pleasing to God than on our worst day. Performance, driven, obedience to God, trying to manage or manipulate God's pleasure with you, amounts to just self-reliance, self-effort. And that's not the way to please God. What is it that pleases God? We just saw who pleases God. That's about identity. What is it that pleases God? When we, when we get that right, then we have security. Well, what is it that pleases God? The thing that God desires of us the thing that pleases him the most is not that we obey the rules, even if those rules are Bible rules. What did he mean when he said to the Jewish people who had been handed by God himself 
a system of sacrifices and offerings. He said, sacrifice and offerings I don't desire. What did he mean by that? The same thing that I'm saying to you, that the thing that God desires from us most, that pleases him the most, isn't that you obey the rules of the Bible because what God wants from us is that we are right with him. It isn't merely that we obey the rules, but that we're right with him. It's not merely that we follow rituals. It's not that obedience is unimportant, folks, but that the basis of obedience is love. It is love for the Lord. Being right with God is the equivalent of having a loving relationship with him in which you love him with all of your heart, in which you love him supremely. You love him ab above your spouse. You love him above your children. You love him above your parents. You love him above any other human being. You love the Lord with all of your heart. Really, that's what his entire redemption plan is all about. That's what he meant when he said in Matthew 15, 8, this people draws nigh to me with their mouth and honors me with their lips, but they don't love me from their heart. Their heart's far from me. They don't love me. They talk about me, and they say all these things that sound good about me, and they do all these things, but they don't do it from a heart of love. And that's what he meant in the great Shema. The Lord our God is one. He then says, and you're to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, your soul, your might, your being. And so what pleases God is that you are rightly related to him because you love him with your whole heart. You never fake it. It's real. And there's another thing that, that pleases God. And, but really, it stems from loving him. And that is that you trust him. That you have faith. Really, love builds total trust. Remember, the writer of Hebrews says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so it, it is love that builds trust in him. You place greater dependence, that's what, that's what faith is, it's dependence upon God. You place greater dependence in God as you grow more to know him deeply. The more you know him, the more you love him. The more you know and love him, the more you trust him. The more you place dependence upon him. And so that's how, that's what it means to please God, okay? So that's security. Then there's a third thing that I want to finish up with tonight. How do you please God? Well, the answer to that is in the area of ability. How do you please God? Believers don't obey to try to please God in order to gain his favor. But if we're going to please God then we must obey, but we have to do it from the right motivation. And so you please God when your motivation is right. What is the motivation? Well, we obey God because of a love relationship that, that generates from us then a natural and a grateful obedience. I don't obey because God has a stick and he's going he's, he's gonna to hit me hard with it if I don't obey. I obey God because I love him and I'm thankful for all that he has done for me and continues to do for me. I'm motivated by his love. That is why God places an emphasis on the heart. Let Jesus cleanse your heart and give you a new heart from him and for him and that's what he's talking about in Matthew 15, 8, when he laments, you know, these people, their heart's far from me. Uh, uh, they, they do these things, but it's not out of a heart of love that they're doing them. Their motivation is wrong. 
It's a heart love that, that Jesus wants from us. And as a response to his love, then we please him by obeying him. That's what Paul meant when he said this. The love of Christ constrains me. He obeyed because the love of Christ was the driving force in his heart. That's the motivation for obedience. Anything other than that isn't the, isn't the right kind of obedience. The How do we please God? By having a right motivation, and that motivation is the love of Christ constrains me. It, it's a choice also. It's a choice. It's a, it's a decision of not only a right motivation, but it's, it, it is a decision of cooperation, a motivation and a cooperation. You see, oh, uh, this kind of obedience is not uh, a passive obedience, but it's an act of cooperation with the Holy Spirit within you. You're, you're motivated by the love of Christ, and at the very moment that you choose to depend upon him, and you step out in faith to obey him, you know what he does? He provides an inner supernatural lift in your spirit and all the enablement that is necessary to accomplish whatever he asks you to do. There's very practical areas of obedience in daily life that, uh, of course, need the right motivation and cooperation. For instance, there is that area of mercy. God wants us to be the dispensers of mercy to other people. He wants us to forgive people. Uh, we could look at uh, passages like Matthew 18 uh, or Ephesians chapter 4, where we're to be kind one to another and forgive one another as, as God for Christ's sake hath forgiveness, mercy, showing people mercy. That's, that's God-like. Another area that uh, we can obey God in is in the area what I would call charity, which is love, love to others, loving others. And uh, uh, in, in, in order to do that, uh, you have to see the worth of those people from God's viewpoint. You have to view them through Jesus's eyes. First Corinthians 13, it's all about loving others, especially those few verses four through eight, the characteristics of real love for others. And there's a, a, another area in which God, uh, we can please God through our obedience that's rightly motivated and we're cooperating with him to, to do it. And that is in the area of humility, where we think more highly of other people than we do ourselves. Remember in Romans 12, 3, Paul says that we should not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. In Philippians 2, we should esteem others better than ourselves. And another area would be in the area of, uh, of what I would call glory. When, when Paul suffers in 2 Corinthians 12, he says this, I've come to the point where I glory in suffering. It sounds like he's, you know, uh, what's wrong with this guy? You know, uh, how could he glory in suffering? Because of this, he says, when I, when I suffer, I find that that's when God strengthens me the most. When I'm the weakest, that's when I can draw upon his all-sufficient strength. His grace is sufficient for me. His strength is adequate for me. And he says, so I glory in suffering. <laughs> so there's an area we suffer in various ways. May that bring glory to God. May it be something that we glory in in and glorify God through because of this. I would close with simply this. Uh, if fighter jets, you know, there's different, there's old ones, F-15s, there's F-16s, there's newer ones, F-35s, F-22s. I don't know if you're into fighter jets, but it's kind of amazing those, what they can do how maneuverable they are, how versatile they are, how powerful they are. And yet, those fighter jets really 
are no more valuable than a doorstop without a pilot controlling them. And so if we apply that to us, our lives really are no more valuable for service to God without us totally yielding to him and relying upon him to pilot our lives. Surrender and dependence.